The Buddha once said that concentration, when nurtured by virtue, has great fruit, great reward. Now, he's not saying that you can't do concentration without virtue. There are many examples around of people who have very strong powers of concentration, but very little virtue at all. What he is saying is that if you want your concentration to yield great fruit, in other words, in terms of bringing about the discernment that leads to release, it has to be done in the context of a life where you're trying to be virtuous in your actions. Taking your actions and your words seriously, and also taking seriously the impact that they have, both on yourself and on others. It's this sensitivity to your actions and their results. That's what helps to bring your concentration to a state where it can lead to great fruit. In other words, if you go through life not really being careful about what you do and not really being sensitive to the impact of your actions, it's going to be very hard for you to be very careful about your meditation and to be sensitive to cause and effect as they happen in the mind. Because virtue is largely the practice of applying mindfulness and alertness. To your actions. You have to keep your precepts in mind and you have to be alert to what you're actually doing. There's a story of one of John Fung's students who had practiced meditation with him for quite a while in Bangkok, decided to come out to the monastery in Ryong, observe the eight precepts for a week. So she took the eight precepts, and that afternoon as she was walking past one of the guava trees, she noticed how the guavas were ripe, and just waiting to be picked. And so she picked one and took, took a bite. John Fung happened to be a little ways off. He said, hey, what's that in your mouth? And she realized she'd totally forgotten about her precepts. And so I consoled her. I say, well, it's important that you really observe one precept, and that's the precept of the mind. Because after all, the mind is what's in charge of your actions. If you stay mindful of your intentions, it's going to cover your words and your deeds. But words and deeds deal in particulars, and so you have to be dealing in the particulars as well. For example, if you've got the precept against killing, how are you going to deal with ants? How are you going to deal with termites? This forces you to think like an ant, think like a termite. When they come into your house, why do they come? Where do they come from? What ways can you deal with them without killing them? This moves from simply being mindful and alert to developing discernment and empathy. You learn to empathize with the ants, empathize with the termites. They're looking for food, they're looking for water. You have to learn how to put yourself in their mind. You've got to learn how to deal with them. So again, the discernment and the empathy, those are good qualities for your concentration. And there are going to come times when you come up against really difficult issues that are not easy to solve. And that's to remind you, of course, that living in this world, it's hard not to harm beings, even if you don't intend to. And it's not just an awkwardness when you take the precepts, but the simple fact of your being born into this world with needs. You need food, you need clothing, you need shelter, you need medicine. These things involve suffering one way or another. 
not only for yourself and trying to get these things, but also by other people, other beings that are involved in one way or another in the production chain. So that's meant to give rise to a sense of sanwega. That if you want to be totally harmless, you have to get out. You have to stop participating in this process of samsara. So as you observe the precepts, you're developing a lot of good qualities in mind that are helpful in the meditation. You see the harm that comes simply from the fact that you're alive and trying to minimize that harm. by minimizing the harmful intentions in your mind. You realize it's the training of the mind and only the training of the mind that's going to get you out of this mess, to get you out of this addiction. It may sound selfish that you want to get out and leave everybody else behind, but that's not the, the right way to think of these issues. Samsara, the wandering on, is a process. It's an activity. It's an addiction. And so the best way to deal with an addiction, and the kindest way to deal with other people who are addicted, is for you to learn how to overcome your addiction. Then once you've done that, if you can help, you help other people overcome theirs. But it's not like you're leaving them in a lurch. At the very least, you're giving them a good example that, that it can be done. So it's in this way that Virtue takes concentration and provides the right context in the mind, a context of mindfulness and alertness, empathy, goodwill, compassion, and a sensitivity to cause and effect, and a sens sensitivity to the impact that you have on others. This part is very important because this is one of the main areas where we tend to be very deluded and in a lot of denial. We don't like to think that we harm other beings, or that our actions have actually harmed anybody in any way that really counts. And so we find ways of discounting other beings, in case we may suspect that some harm has been done. So well, it doesn't really matter, or those people don't matter, or those beings don't matter, or whatever. whether my intentions were good, and therefore my good intentions should count for everything. When the Buddha has you look at your actions, you look both at your intentions and at the results. It's not a matter of either or, it's both and. And we do this so that we can learn. It's not that we're trying to pass a final judgment on ourselves or our actions. But we want to see where do our actions harm others and what can we do not to harm them. And when you think of this process of evaluating your actions in this way, then it's a, a lot easier to be open and honest with yourself about them. You're not pretending that you're totally pure and totally perfect. I've met a couple monks who are very proud of the fact that their precepts have been perfect. But you actually look at their behavior, and what they've done is they've redefined the precept to suit their behavior. So once an element of pride comes into the practice, then it starts distorting things. You want to have always the attitude, I'm willing to learn. If I can find a better way to do things, I want to find it. This quality of ingenuity is also an important part of providing the right framework for your concentration. As John Lee once said, the waves of the mind are more than many, and it's certainly more than you can put in a book. Or the easy meditation instructions. We 
which means that a lot of the practice you've got to come up with your own instructions. You take the basic principles and you learn how to apply them. And if applying them one way doesn't work, you turn them around and apply them another way. Or find another strategy for applying them. You've got to use your own ingenuity. So the ingenuity that's required in trying to keep your precepts even in difficult circumstances. Say when someone asks you a question and you know that if you tell them the full truth about the answer, it's going to harm them, give rise to greed, anger, and delusion. So you've got to be ingenious in how to change the topic or how to give a partial answer without lying. And an ability to be ingenious, to plan ahead of time, knowing sometimes that someone is going to ask a particular question, and preparing yourself so that you don't have to suddenly think up the answer on, at the last minute. So the practice of virtue, if you take it seriously and you do it skillfully, develops a lot of discernment. It requires discernment. And John Lee makes the point that people sometimes practice virtue to help their concentration and practice concentration to help their discernment. But they don't think about turning around and using their discernment to help with their virtue and their concentration, which is why it doesn't go very far. But if you realize you've got to bring discernment to the way you observe the precepts, bring discernment to the way you practice concentration, then all three aspects of what are called the triple training help one another. Concentration when nurtured by virtue leads to discernment, bears fruit in discernment. Discernment, when nurtured by concentration, bears fruit in release. That's the standard pattern. But the pattern that you discover in the practice is that you've got to use your concentration to work on your virtue and, and your discernment, and use your discernment to work on your concentration and your virtue. So it's good to stop and think for a while about virtue and how it actually applies to the training of the mind not simply go through the motions of observing the precepts or resenting the precepts when they get difficult. Think of them as providing you with food for thought, food for contemplation about the nature of what it is to be a human being, the nature of action, the qualities of your intentions. Are your good intentions really skillful intentions? There's a difference, you know. Good intentions can have delusion, where skillful intentions don't. That's the distinction. So we use the precepts for training purposes. It's not that we simply just hold on to them and hope that by following the precepts we'll be good little boys and good little girls and we get a reward. That's called clinging to ha habits and practices. That's a fetter. But if you see them as an opportunity to develop discernment and then apply your discernment to them, then beca they become useful tools in the path. It's not that once you've reached the level of stream entry they don't need the precepts anymore. When you let go of that fetter of groping in habits and practices. Actually, at that point, your precepts become really solid, because the mind has reached a state where it's always clear about its intentions. And so it's always going to act on skillful intentions. It's no longer groping because it understands exactly how the precepts function. They don't guarantee awakening, but they do give you food for thought. They do train the mind.
and qualities of mindfulness, alertness, ingenuity, discernment. compassion and empathy. In this sense, they soften the mind. So you recognize a mistake when it happens. We're not stubborn. We don't put up walls of resistance and denial. So it makes the mind a lot more sensitive to what it's doing and the results of what it's doing and encourages the desire to do these things as skillfully as possible, when you have those qualities and bring them to your concentration. It's a lot easier to work through the problems that come up, and it's a lot easier to be sensitive to what's going on in the mind. So that your concentration will yield the kind of discernment that really does lead to release. <coughs> 